Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for a special edition of the show. Um, yeah, I didn't feel like setting up the set because you know, I'm just gonna do today and next week's show at the same time, and then probably not record for a couple weeks, but I wanted to get something kind of easy. Besides the next episode, it's gonna be kind of fun. Um, gonna have a lot of special episodes this, the next from now till New Year's. Um, the next episode, I'm not gonna sit at the, I'm not gonna sit at the, um, the set, the big table anyway, I'm going to sit here on the couch and relax because it involves some fun stuff. Well, hopefully fun stuff. All right, so um, <clears throat> this is our Thanksgiving episode. Um, everyone wants to know what to drink for Thanksgiving, right? So um, so I, I've picked three wines that uh, um, one was sent to me for a sample to, to sample, and the other two I have purchased um, through whatever means I had. And um, I thought they'd be good wines for Thanksgiving. I don't want to say they're traditional choices, um, but um, we all know I love sparkling. And uh, I'm just trying to see if this is working the way it should. No, it's not. So we're just going to use the phone for everything. Um, I love when syncing doesn't work. Anyway, and for some reason, OneNote doesn't want to work either. But it's on the phone. I have everything ready to go. Um, so anyway... That's what I meant to do was start my little timer on here. So I had, so I was able to do, do my do. Here we go. Now, there we go. Anyway, so I'll start that when I start the first wine. But uh, do Thanksgiving, so we know I like sparkling wine. And I think uh, you should almost try to almost always start your, uh, your um, meal with a sparkling wine. I've also got, I'm using natural lighting as much as possible. I don't have the one light. Yeah, it's real minimal set today. Um, but anyway, uh, so I got a sparkling wine. I have two French wines. And, um, you know, I kind of had this somewhat knee jerk reaction that I wanted my Thanksgiving episode to feature French wines with the, all the stuff that happened in Paris. And then, um, but at the same time, I have to go out and buy some French sparkling wine, but I already have sparkling wine to review that's, that I've had for almost two months now. Uh, and I do have two French wines, so we're cool with that. And, but, you know, in France, they don't celebrate Thanksgiving. So featuring French wine for an American holiday may not be, you know, the best way. But, um, and I don't, get, I don't get into politics and all that, but what happened in Paris sucked. Um, since I have been to Paris, have been to France... You know, it, it, there's there's a bit of a oh hey it's opening well you know um, there has been you know not a huge connection but while I was there I did meet up with some uh, relatives that um, we didn't really know we had for a long time until right before I went over there so you know there's 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 at least a bit of a personal connection on my side and I'm sure millions and millions of Americans have connections to probably better connections to France than I do but you know for 10-ish days or so, 9-ish nine, nine days, I visited France and, you know, made some new friends and, uh, and all that. Luckily, a lot of them were not in Paris, but, you know, I, I do hope that uh, however it gets resolved, it gets resolved, but uh, we'll, we won't go any farther into that. So, um, anyway, so wine. So, wines for Thanksgiving. So, um, I mean, you can go to tr truly, completely traditional route, and I do have a wine that's supposed to be showing up this week. We're going to move that to Christmas. It's a Chardonnay. Chardonnay is another, you know, another wine you can have for Christmas. So, but they couldn't get it to me in time. So, um, you know, sparkling wine. I'm going with a, a, a Cava. So again, European wines for Thanksgiving. All right. So, um, you know, sparkling wine is a great wine to start things off with. And then we're going to go to two different reds. We're going to uh, the eastern side of France. We're going to do a Rhone and a Burgundy. All right. So let's. Oh, there you go. Well, we won't worry about trying to set that up right now. 
All right, so the first one we're gonna go to is, uh, let me get a little, a little wah-wah there. All right, so uh, the first the first wine we're uh, gonna start with is, this is the non-vintage, and I don't know if I can get a really good shot of that bottle. Uh, the non-vintage is Segura Viedas, uh, Gran, uh, Grand Cuvée Reserva. Now this was sent to me um, by the distributor and uh, uh, what should I call it? Uh, by the distributor. This retails around $14 to $19 a bottle uh, depending on where you're buying it. Um, like my, my main, <clears throat> my main uh, chain wine shop in town, or the one that I've been going to more often, uh, Total Wine does not carry this particular um, bottle. They carry other uh, Segudas, but um, uh, I've you know, using Wine Searcher, I was able to find a pricing. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about um, the estate. So uh, they have roots dating back to the 11th century. So they've been around a long time. Uh, it started as an inhabited watchtower uh, and was later converted into a Catalan country house in the 13th century growing all kinds of crops for the local monastery, including wine grapes. Uh, then in 1850, it started, or 1850s, it started uh, crafting cavas, becoming the winery that continues to earn its reputation as one of the world's top producers of sparkling wines to this day. The Ferrer family of Barcelona, ex-producer, expert producers of sparkling wine for over 100 years, purchased uh, the estate in the early 1980s. So, Gloria Ferrer, you know that name. All right, so um, now the, uh, the Grand Cuvée Reserva uh, says reflects their commitment to the indigenous varieties while exploring the synthesis of new grapes. Uh, they use uh, Machabeo, Pariada, and then they also add Chardonnay and Pinot Noir to it. Um, they have nine different base wines that are blended to contribute to the unique personality and good acidity, blah, 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 blah. Okay, nine different base wines. Um, let's see, they talked about that. We've already talked about that. I was just trying to think if there's anything. All right, um, they say it's the perfect synthesis of soil, climate, and grape aromatics, which have been aged for 15 months in contact with its lees in our underground caves to produce a blah, 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 blah. Okay, so um, anyway, so Spanish sparkling wine, cava, um, it's mostly in that northeastern part of uh, Spain, but um, uh, there's not, it's not like Champagne where there's like a very specific, like distinct region. However, I want to say that there's been some law changes recently where they try to have a little more definition of what a cava is, but in general, it's, it's, uh, it's a Spanish sparkling wine. So on the nose, we're gonna pour a little bit more in there. Now this was in the fridge for a long time, and then I pulled it out, and probably has been out for about 30 minutes. So it's warmed up a little bit. Same with these; they've warmed up. They were, you know, uh, storing at 55-ish uh, degrees. So on the nose, I mean, I get some type of fruit. Not an explosion of fruit, but I'd say there's maybe apricot. <clears throat> yeah, maybe apricot and uh, maybe a touch of nuttiness to it. This is like the one wine you don't swirl. Okay. Yeah, maybe a little bit, but not 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 a whole lot of it. Yeah, just a hint of nuttiness to it. Maybe like walnut type of thing. Um, 
almost candied, almost candied walnut. And, and this is, I mean, it's so, it's very subtle. It's like, it, it's, it kind of just, it just tastes like sparkling wine, but there's, there's a little bit of uh, nuttiness to it. It's got a good acidity to it. It's a brute, it's not sweet. Um, probably should have reminded you about that. Um, it's almost a bit of, you know, it's, it's, it's acidic, so it kind of has that lemony type of uh, feel to it. Um, like I said, very, very light in the almond, more of almond than, than walnut, but maybe a little bit of almond type flavor to it. Um, it's very refreshing. Um, it's, I don't know what the temperature is outside. It's, uh, well, it's only 69 degrees outside, but a cold front came through uh, early this morning. So um, not, not exactly warm in, for, for refreshing wine, but lots of acid. My mouth is watering a lot. I mean, this is a good start for your meal, uh, whether you're just gonna just do a toast, you know, have like a little, I don't wanna call it a reception, but you have people coming over, you wanna give them something to drink while you're waiting to really get some food going. Um, you know, maybe you're getting, you know, watching the, watching the football game, that kind of stuff. But, um, uh, you know, you want, it, it's a good start, gets the mouth watering, gets the juices flowing. Uh, and it's, it's a very pleasant wine. This is a wine you don't need food with. Um, it'll be great if you want to serve it with, um, maybe like, uh, uh, an appetizer. Maybe you're going to have a cheese tray, maybe nuts and cheeses. Um, that kind of thing. Maybe not so much with the fruit tray, but I can see something a little bit earthier, heartier. Mm -hmm. I think if you had like, uh, like um, a plate with like cheeses and nuts and maybe things like figs um, or dates, those types of, those types of fruits uh, not like, you know, apples and oranges and pears and ra strawberries and raspberries, uh, but other, other type of, um, uh, other types of fruits that would go really great with that. They were started the timer on the watch. Oh, remember kids, don't use the Coravin with sparkling wine. Bad. Okay. And I'm not talking from experience either. I just know you don't use it. So speaking of that, let's move that over here. So we're going to move on to uh, wine number two. All right. So before we get the thing on there. So wine number two is the 2012 Meridian um, Par Pierre Pierre Perrin Cote de Rhone. Now, this wine I got from, oh, there we go. This is the last of the um, Wall Street Journal wines. I pulled this wine out and I'm like, have I had this before? I don't reckon, I mean, it doesn't look like something I've had before. So I looked and made sure I hadn't had it before and and all that good stuff, and sure enough, I hadn't. I had only bought one bottle of it. So this came from the Wall Street Journal wine uh, wine thing that I, I bought a whole bunch of wine from a while ago. And uh, so Cote de Rhone. So um, these are, this is made by the same people who own Chateau de Beaucastle. So does that ring a bell? If it doesn't, that's okay. Um, Chateau de Beaucastle is one of the premier, um, one of the premier Chateau of the Pop uh, producers. Uh, one of its claims to fame. Oh, this is difficult to pull out. There we go. Um, one of its claims to fame is that it traditionally, on the Chateau of the Pop, traditionally uses all of the allowed varietals in the uh, in the wine. This is not that wine. So this is um, uh, a different wine. 
And blah, 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 blah. so let's kind of go through the history. Oh, um, I paid eighteen ninety nine. I probably paid less than that. I mean, it was like package deal, but you can buy it for eighteen ninety nine from um, the link that I have down. I already put down below. Let's see here. Um, the winery takes its name from the Bowcastle family, which lived in Corthazon in the middle of the sixteenth century. Records show that at Pierre de Bowcastle buying a barn and some associated land at Caudelet in 1549. And this land has been part of Chateau de Beaucastle's holdings, uh, still part of that holding. Uh, however, at this time it was an agricultural property. In 1792, the owner was called Etienne Gontard, uh, and the first certain mentioning of vines on the property are from his inheritance 40 years later. So um, fast forward... And in 1909, uh, it was bought by Pierre Tramier, um, and the vineyards were rebuilt out under his ownership. After him, his son-in-law, Pierre Perrin, took over and expanded the chateau's vineyard holdings considerably. Uh, it's, been the, it's, it's been in the Perrin family ever since. Um, and let's see, Jean-Pierre Perrin and Francois Perrin are now the the uh, guys who run the place. Um, now, this appears to be a wine that was really just kind of um, kind of an exclusive wine for Lathwaite. Lathwaite in London and Wall Street Journal wine in the United States have the exact same wine. As a matter of fact, it's the exact same descriptions. They just you know have different. They're just in different uh, you, you know different parts of the world. And then I thought there was one other place that actually had this wine. You cannot find this wine on the main website, not the Bowcastle website, but the Perrin website, because they have one that lists all their stuff. Uh, let's see, there's 60% Grenache, 20% Syrah, 10% Mavedra, 5% 5 5% Cinso, and 5% Carignan. So it's you know a GSM with Cinso and Carignan. Um, let's see here. Now this is part. This is from the kind of description from the Wall Street Journal and Lathwaite re website. Um, two brothers at the helm were named Decanter Magazine's 2014 Men of the Year, uh, and their iconic Chateau de Beaucastle is considered by many to be the finest Chateau Neuf of all. What's bump bouncing over there? Here, just turn that away. I don't need it. Um, to, 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 today you can enjoy their exclusive Cote de at a tempting friends only price. For this special cuvee from 93.2012, Wine Spectator. So I, I think what they mean by is the 2012 vintage was 93 point. Um, selected fruit from three of their favorite vineyards on the family estate. Uh, they were hand sorted and, uh, and then the wine lavished with the legendary parent TLC. All right, so let's check it out. Can you do both hands at the same time? I can. Gets a little tricky when you try to start them both at the same time because you want to concentrate on each of them so you don't go whoop, right? Once you got it going. All right, so a little bit of woodsiness to it. But a lightness to it, nothing, not heavy. Little um, mintiness. Some red fruits. Some spices. So generic stuff, you know, woodsy, spices, minty maybe, a little red fruit. Cedar box, now it's opening up a little bit more. Another taste. Mm. 
so at first it was wasn't getting much. I mean, for like ten seconds, and all of a sudden, yes, I got it, and um, I got that leathery um, flavor, uh, cedar box dustiness to it. Um, not entirely accordion case, um, but very close to that. Um, but yeah, earthy, very earthy, but not like, not like, you know, forest floor or wet dirt type of thing, but very earthy, kind of dusty, kind of leathery cedar box. So a little bit of woodsy. For fruit, I do get red fruits. I might I might go as far as a raspberry because there's a bit of savory or, you know, a bit of savoriness to it or blackberry maybe, like that. Not not like, you know, strawberry or cherry, but maybe like a blackberry, yeah. I get that out of it. Sounds like I'm make, I just made that up, but sometimes I go to raspberry as my, as my main alternate fruit, but then I started thinking, no, I've had blackberries recently. This tastes more like a blackberry. So darker fruits. Um, so not, this is not a, this is a bright wine, but it's not like a super dark wine. It's not heavy. Um, tannins are about medium acid is say about medium plus. Um, it's a good, it's a good, you know, like overall wine that should pair well with most things. Um, it's probably gonna be a little bit heavier than this Pinot Noir. I, the reason I went in the direction I did was more about pricing. Um, started with the white and then I went with the least, the, the less expensive red wine. Uh, finish off with a more expensive red wine. Um, but uh, I really like this wine, which if memory serves, some of the wine, some of the wines I got from Wall Street Journal were kind of like, eh, you know, I, was, I probably was expecting a lot more out of them than, than they delivered, but that they were bad wines. It's a really nice wine. I mean, it's what, 19 bucks, 20, under $20. Um, so plus shipping, whatever. But um, if you could find this wine in a, uh, in a wine shop somewhere, you know, I definitely would buy it. It's gonna be a good solid wine. It'd be a good wine for a Thanksgiving dinner. Um, you know, you've got, and the reason I think of that is because you have a lot of, I have earthiness with Thanksgiving dinners. <clears throat> So I think that goes really well with, you know, the spices that you have with Thanksgiving dinner. This type of stuff will pair well with it. Not that you can't have, you know, a Napa cab with the stuff, you know, fruit bomb kind of juxt juxtaposed with, you know, some of the Christmas spices. But I think that's a, I think that does a really good job. All right. Now let's move on. Do, do, do. To wine number three. Da -da. All right. Not much easier. All right. I already I forgot to tell you what the wine was. All right. So this is the two. Oh, sorry. This is the two thousand nine Domaine Henri de la, de la Grange. Volney Premier Cru Champagnes. What? Okay, one more time. 2009 Domaine Henry Delagrange Volney Premier Cru Champagnes. All right. I know sometimes, and yeah, we know my French isn't the best, at least the pronunciation of it. <clears throat> so I thought I'd. Americanized a little bit more. So there's there's the label. I know it's probably all washed out with the white. Uh, so what is this? So oh, and um, so I got this. So do you all remember back in what 2013 ish? I interviewed Eddie Osterland, uh, the first Master Psalm. So yeah, this is actually from something that he does. Now it's called Truly Wine. It was called uh, My My Cellar Master, but now this is called Truly Fine Wine. So he has wines that he curates. We want to use that word 
um, you know, stuff that he recommends through this website. That I'm sure he gets a cut out of it or he owns 100% of it. I'm not really sure. I don't remember about that. But um, there was a Burgundy flight, a two a two bottle Burgundy, Burgundy flight you, you could buy. And I bought this at the end of 2013. Um, and uh, I purchased the flight for $89.95 for two bottles. This was one. And I don't know where the other one is. I probably drank it. It was not reviewed because at least as far as like looking up, um, as far as looking up uh, key, um, keywords on the site, apparently I never review Burgundy wines <laughs> or I don't list them as Burgundy. So that might be an issue there. Anyway, um, so as far as I know, I did not review the other wine. I might have, but I don't know. Now I think, now currently on the website, this wine, same vintage and everything, is paired with uh, 2011 Maison L'Envoy Bourgogne. Uh, 2011 Maison L'Envoy Bourgogne, all right, a Burgundy. Um, I don't have a review of that wine on my site. Um, as the, wine is per, is, the wine is currently paired with this one, so it's probably the same wine. Um, now, this wine right now is being sold for $54.95, and um, the other wine is like 20 bucks. So now the flight is 70, is now the flight 70, 79.95. So it went down $10. But anyway, so that's where I got the wine. Um, so who are they? So first of all, let's talk about, um, this is a premier crew. I'm, I'm gonna attempt it, premier crew. It actually probably sounded all right. I don't know, I'll have to let Ceci and Fabian, everybody else who speaks French, Peter, all you guys, if you all watch it, to tell me whether I did a good job on that. Um, but a Premier Crew is the next, is like the, the so you have, you have Crew, we have like regular, we have a regular Burgundy, okay? Then you, so then you have Village, then you have Premier Crew, then you have Grand Crew, okay? So this is the one step below. So this is in the Volnay region, uh, Volnay area of Burgundy. So um, it was in the Cote de Bonne. And uh, some of the vineyards in the, in the Volnay are actually in Merceau. Um, and they're allowed to use the Volnay appellation instead of Merceau. Uh, it's also a thing about legality is what you can use red and white wines for with Merceau and, and Volnay and all that. So they'll use, they'll use uh, the Volnay designation. There are no Grand Cru's in Volnay, but um, there are several highly regarded Premier Cru's uh, in the AOC, or the designation was created in 1937. Um, in 2008, there were 206.7 hectares, or 511 acres, of vineyard service was in production uh, for Volnay wine at village and Premier Cru level, and um, they produced 7,733 hectoliters of wine. Just over a million bottles came out of there. All right, so the regulations allow up to 15% total of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, I'm sorry, Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris as accessory wines in uh, the red wines, but this is not, this, this is not very often practiced. Um, the allowed base yield is 40 hectoliter per he hectare. Grapes must reach a maturity of at least 10.5% potential alcohol. Uh, for village level and 11% for premier crew. Um, and then this says the style of Vonet is typically light and aromatic and elegant rather than powerful with uh, considerably less tannin than Pomard wines from the neighboring village. There are 30 climats of which um, uh, Champagne, yeah, Champagne's is one of them. Matter of fact, when you, when, in the Wikipedia entry, Champagne's was the only one that actually had a link, but then it, it, it goes back to Volnay. So I'm, I'm going to assume that Champagne's is, um, and it does say, uh, it's, it's one of the most region, it's one of the region's most prized sites for Pinot Noir, the Champagne's uh, Climat. Um, also famous for its Chardonnay, Cote de Bone in the south, contains two communes, Pomard and Volnay. Oh, so Cote de Bone is known for Chardonnay. Um, the, that produced Pinot Noir rivaling that of the Cote de Nuit, which is northern part of the Cote, Cote d'Or, okay? Um, let's see. 
This vineyard is situated just short, just a short distance southeast of the village of Volnay and lies at the heart of the commune's prime vineyard sites. Um, the location allows the vines to benefit from well-drained limestone-rich soils, Camerigian, oh, um, in a southeast-facing orientation, which helps them fully utilize the morning and early afternoon sun. Okay, so who makes this? <laughs> Uh, Didier Delgrange joined the family business in 1990 after completing his studies um, at Lycee Victol, also known as La Vidi, in Bone. Um, he's sixth generation of, the, of this prominent Cote de Bone family to run the domain when he took over for his father in 2003. So, generations about 20 years, so, so they've been making wine for six, we'll say 60 to 80 years they've, they've had the domain. Um, depending on when this was written. Um, all right, so the pride of the domain is its prime parcel in Volnay Premier Cru, Claude de Chenez, planted in 1939. Since taking over, the DDA family and his wife, Helene, have also added a 55-year-old uh, Pinot Noir parcel in Alax Corton, blah, 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 blah. They, so they, they've got, they've got uh, sites throughout the place. And then I want to try to see if there's something about. Uh, they purchased, or they, uh, the first vintage that they got from this uh, vineyard, uh, Climat, is uh, 2007. All right, and then uh, manual harvesting using small bins with strict selection in the vineyard. Let's see, uh, we'll kind of do a little geeky stuff here. All fruit is destemmed, 15 to 18 day cuvaison. Cuv for reds in thermoregulated open tanks in the pigeage on alternate days. Combination of new and older neutral barrels used for 10 to 15 months. Depends on the wine. No more than 20% new wood. Uh, reds, reds then racked and put in temperature controlled stainless steel tanks for three month gravity clarification settling period. Only bottom third of tanks filtered coarse lenticular. I probably should know more about what all this says, but that's the kind of geeky stuff. And uh, overall production for the, for the um, domain is 75,000 bottles. All right, let's check it out. Kind of funky, but not like the normal funk. Okay, yeah, kind of the normal funk now. <clears throat> Got George Clinton hanging out in the back. So yeah, funky, and we're just gonna stick with that word. You know, earthy. Not much fruit. But you know, this really is kind of um, forest floor a lot. Yeah, like you get the you get the dry leaves or maybe more more like wet leaves, you know, that type of stuff. Let's get a taste in here. So kind of a, <clears throat> a tart cherry to it. On, on the palate, it's not as funky as it is, you know, earthy as it is on the nose. Um, good acidity. Actually, pretty good tannin. They say they're softer tannins, but this is pretty good tannin. I mean, it's right up here, right up there. Um, doesn't really coat the rest of the mouth necessarily, but I got some, got some uh, um, acidity really kind of spread out on the tongue. Um, I really need some food with this. Um, you know, this, I really think you're going to have, you know, if, if you're doing somewhat traditional uh, Thanksgiving fare, like turkey and stuffing, you know, the stuffing um, or the cran or cranberries 
that kind of stuff, this is going to pair so well with that, okay? Um, this is definitely a food wine. You might even, you know, with the, the, with the ham and the cloves, all that kind of stuff, traditional stuff. Um, but, you know, this is a hearty enough wine that it'll stand up to most of your traditional Thanksgiving fare. I mean, this is, I'm not saying you couldn't have this with a steak, you could. You probably wouldn't want it with like some over the top ribeye that's like seasoned heavily, um, you know, black end or anything like that. But if you had it with a steak, it would be totally fine too. Like this could handle probably most steaks. Um, but if you're talking like duck, turkey, lamb, uh, pork, all that kind of stuff, ham, all right, absolutely 100%. This is a killer wine. Um, and, and longtime viewers know that Burgundy and I aren't, we're not enemies by any means, but I'm not like, a, I don't view Burgundy as, in Riesling, as like the end all be all of wines. They're, they're wines, they're really good wines. There's other wines out there that are really good too. So, um, however, as I get more and more into this and I get exposed to more good Burgundies, and I think that's what the reason why I didn't have the view of Burgundy like some other people, some of my other peers, is that I've drank a lot of bad Burgundy, there's a lot of bad Pinot Noir in general. Um, but as I drink more quality uh, Pinot Noirs and specifically Burgundies, I start, and, and, and white and red Burgundy, I'm starting to really kind of get into it. I heard the phone vibrate. Okay. No, that'd be the phone right there. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a really good wine. Now, if you can find this specific wine uh, somewhere, this is the one I, I thought I saw elsewhere, um, besides on Eddie's site or the site that sells his the wines that he cho cho chooses, chosen. Um, I mean, it's 60 bucks. This is not a cheap wine by any means. Um, but when you're talking about holidays and talking about something special and you want to splurge a little bit, you know, I mean, if you're going to have like 20 people over, you're probably not going to be able, you know, that's a lot of money to buy. But let's say you want to bring a bottle to a gathering, um, you know, you have a small gathering or you want to get a couple bottles, that type of thing. Totally. Absolutely. Well, I hope all of you are going to have a fun and safe uh, Thanksgiving holiday for those of you that celebrate in the United States. Uh, for those of you in Canada, I think you already did yours. Um, and then anywhere else is just going to have, you know, some good food and, and elsewhere around the world, you're going to have some, you know, good traditional uh, fall type food. These wines will go great with all that kind of stuff. Um, Hell, you could probably even pair it with, you know, food that's like outside of like turkey beef or turkey pork, lamb, that kind of stuff. You want to pair it with, you know, heavier beefs or, you know, Spanish or, or Italian fare or German fare. Ooh, some like, some like bratwursts. Yeah. I do miss that. I do miss getting a good brat. Can't really, it's not as convenient down here. I mean, you have to go to the store to get it, you know, you, just about every place in Chicago had it. Um, so yeah, good stuff. All, all three wines, kind of over there by yourself together. You want you feel lonely. Um, all three wines are great buys for what, they, for what they are, and I highly recommend all three. That's going to do it for this episode. Um, be sure to check out next week's episode. Haven't recorded it yet. But I anticipate it's going to be a lot of fun, or it could be pretty boring. I don't know. Uh, click the links above to friend me up. Hit the donate button over here uh, to uh, send me some ducats for some more wine. And leave comments below. And um, that's going to do it. We'll see everyone again next time.